Welcome to the UAF Summer Sessions in the University of Alaska Press Authors Corner. This evening we're very lucky to have with us Linda Shannon-Meyer who will be sharing her views on the practice of memoir and its power to nurture and heal. Um, thanks to those of you in particular here in the room at UAF's Engineering, Learning, and Innovation Facility for attending. Um, I want to be clear that the University of Alaska Fairbanks has re-implemented a strict COVID-19 policy requiring face coverings and social distancing inside buildings for everyone. Um, thanks also to those of you who are tuning in to live stream uh, or the video recording later on from Alaska or from anywhere else. Thanks for your interest and your attention. Uh, thanks also to the University of Alaska Office of Information Technology. Thanks to Scott and to JC Ice who's here with us tonight. Thanks to Michelle Bartlett and the Summer Sessions for organizing these uh, fun and stimulating summer events for your charge. Uh, thanks uh, very much to tonight's presenter, Linda Chandler, and to all of the UA Press authors for agreeing to participate in this reading and the Authors' Corner series. Um, I hope you'll make it worth their while. Uh, you can find more information in a purchase link uh, for Linda's book coming out of nowhere at the UA Press website. Uh, that's alaska.edu slash UA Press, um, and I'll also have copies here for sale after Linda's presentation uh, in the lobby area back there. Um, I believe we'll have some time for questions at the end of Linda's presentation. Please consider any information and details you'd like to hear more about as you, uh, as you listen to her tonight. Um, I'll have the microphone here for any questions in the room. It makes it um, so that people online can hear. For anyone on the live stream, uh, please use the Google Form link below the video window or visit um, bit.ly, uh, that's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash author Q&A, no spaces. Uh, also, please consult the calendar for the rest of the summer and make plans to attend any other events that interest you. Uh, we'll post the rest of the scheduled Authors Corner presentations at the conclusion of tonight's event. We have one more next week, next Monday, be the conclusion with Tom Alton. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Linda Shanmire is a lifelong Alaskan, teacher, gardener, and poet. She grew up on a family homestead six miles south of Anchorage in the 1950s and 60s. She moved north in 1967 to attend the University of Alaska. Her collection of poems coming out of nowhere is part memoir and part historical document. The poems celebrate the unique and nurturing aspects of homestead life, but do not shy away from unpleasant family details. Also including an earlier collection listing hard among the birches in this poetry has been awarded numerous prizes and distinctions, including the 2019 Willa Literary Award, an artist in residence appointment at Denali National Park in 2012, the Westmason Individual Artist Project Award in 2006, and an Individual Artist Fellowship from the Alaska State Council on the Arts in 1984. She is a winner of the Midnight Sun, Phagis, and Anchorage Daily News UAA Prizes for Poetry. Uh, Linda's poems have been set to music in three song cycles, one of which, Poem Against the Cold, by British composer Corey Field, is performed at Carnegie Hall. A retired biologist and elementary school teacher and an active master gardener and political activist, Linda lives here in Fairbanks, Alaska. Please join me in welcoming Linda Schumann. Well, hello everybody. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, as Nate said, I am going to talk about about how this, writing this memoir affected me. I was not expecting what actually happened when I started writing this memoir. I discovered that that memoir really does have the power to nurture you and heal. And I'm going to uh, talk about that by, by um, illustrating those points with some of the poems from my collection. So as Nate said, I did grow up on a 160-acre homestead. It was about six and a half miles from Anchorage, Alaska, which at that point was a very small town of about 11,000 people. It, it, uh, Anchorage actually really began as a, as a city in about 1920, so in 1950 it wasn't that old. Um, well, um, Nate did thank the UAF Summer Sessions, Lifelong Learning, and the UA Press, but I'd like to echo those thanks for hosting the Author's Corner Lectures, and also to say I really feel a debt of gratitude to the Rasmussen Foundation for 
the individual artist fellowship I received because that was the, the beginning of the, the manuscript that became this book. And I, I also would like to acknowledge that li it's very likely that my family were not the first people to uh, live on this land because this was part of the homeland of the Denina um, people and they had arrived in South Central Alaska over a thousand years before white settlers. So um, considering what's, what is memoir? Um, it's defined loosely as a portion of one's life told as a story with a focus on a particular slice of your life. So it's not your whole life, it's just a portion. And so when I began to write these poems for this collection, my goal was to try to capture the essence of life on the homestead. But um, so, I mean, so at first I was writing about the place and about the setting and, and the beauty and the toughness and the austerity of, of living there and a little bit about the Homestead Act, which um, was a way that people could acquire some land, 160 acres, but they, there were requirements. You had to build a house. You had to live in the house for five years. You had to grow a crop. And uh, that none of that was, was easy. It required a lot of time. And it, of course, required some money. And um, those things were in pretty short supply, usually. So there was a lot of struggling to, meet, to, to make ends meet. And as a result, looking back on that, I see that there wasn't a lot of time for my parents to nurture us and to kind of guide us on our way as we, as we grew up. But in spite of all that, it was a very beautiful place. And uh, my brother and sister and I were uh, free to roam those 160 acres as, as soon as we had finished our chores. And um, my mom was a bit of a taskmaster, and she would check to see if you had, had really done your chores. In particular, I remember her checking under the, uh, under the couch to see if I had swept up the cobwebs under there, which I thought was kind of annoying. But anyway, chores done, out we go. And we would spend, in the summertime, we would spend most of the day outside. And um, we, we did not have any mosquito dope. And there were a lot of mosquitoes in those days. And so we developed different ways, of course, to to uh, chase off the mosquitoes, the the most the, the most useful method was to grab a uh, a willow switch or something like that and just wave it like crazy around your head and upper body. Worked pretty well. I think I got pretty Im immune to mosquito bites. And then in the winter time, um, we went to school, and there was a school bus that, that would come and pick up. Uh, all the all the kids that are around, and those were mo many were, were just homestead kids who lived on these uh, large um, homesteads, and so it would take out it would take an hour to get all the homestead kids picked up and then go take them to school. So it was often a long a long long bus ride. Um, <clears throat> so, but also in the winter we would ice skate. We had a very a little pond that drained our swamp and um, it was kind of bumpy, but we would just get a shovel and clear it off and we'd go out there and skate. And I would imagine that I was a, a famous Olympic skater and so forth and so on. And um, one of the other things I would say is that my mom, she had rules of the, you know, we could go out and run around the homestead, but there were rules. And here were, these are her rules. Number one, was to be home at lunchtime. We had no watch, but we were supposed to be home at lunchtime. Number two was to be home at dinner time, And again, we had no watch, but we were supposed to be in earshot. And the third rule was don't cross any roads. And there were two roads you could cross, and that was the old Seward Highway, and the other was the O'Malley Road. Those were the roads that were, that were nearby. Now, the title poem I'm going to read, and it's the, called Coming Out of Nowhere, and it'll, it will set the scene, and you can get a sense of how isolated we were. 
Um, even though we were six and a half miles from town, my mother didn't drive, and, and um, there weren't any nearby kids. Once in a while, there'd be a family that moved in somewhere, but um, usually there were no kids nearby. So, um, you know, the, we were the three of us there. And of course, you know how siblings are. They, there's, there's, somebody's always out when there's three kids, you know, so, and I was the middle kid, so, um, of course, I didn't know that, that the, the natural thing that happens is that kids form bonds across, and they skip, to, they skip one, so like the oldest kid would form a, form a bond with the youngest. So I was often the, the odd person out, which was, turned out to be okay, because I got to do a lot of reading, um, probably why I'm, I'm a writer. Um, so anyway, uh, oh, the other thing was, was when my dad homesteaded there, uh, there were no, um, there wasn't a road to the property. I mean, you think six and a half miles from Anchorage, there's certainly a road, but there was no road. You had to, he had to park downtown, which was um, called, there was a road called Campbell Creek Trail, and uh, it's Potter Road on some of the maps today. But anyway, he would park there, and he would walk down the railroad tracks, along the Alaska Railroad tracks, and then he'd walk, he had to walk across the swamp to get to the place. And I'm not really sure how he got the lumber there for the house, except that there was a trail along there, which I think was put in um, for the railroad for maintenance and so forth. I think that probably that was what he, he uh, used. Anyway, um, coming out of nowhere, The earth near our place was cradle. It rocked us, became our skin. House doors opened, spilled us out. We disappeared into trees. They clothed us in delirious green. We wore them like coats, learned from black branches and bent trunks their sun and rain vocabulary. We grew up astonished, whole, but ghosts of ourselves, shushed, mourned by wind. Our tongues tasted sun, our shoes muddy, scouting creek. We chewed dogwood berries, learned later they were poisonous, lay in tall grass as clouds revealed their animals saw iris petals like purple flags, walked to cranberries, picked some scarlet like lips. Claustrophobic walls exchanged for this, light and shadow, everything unresolved, lonely. We knew the song of this place, made it up, sang it, not a lament, until years later. And then I mentioned that, that we were, that we ice skated sometimes in the winter. And um, so I, this is a poem about that. It's called Ice's Apprentice. This is how the cold knows her, each stroke and glide of her skates, each ice crystal claiming her toes as she circles the small pond. She's an Olympic skater coached by winter. Home from school after the hour-long bus ride, she shovels her own rink. Dusk writes on her slate of ice. Its lead gray pencil rubs over her whole sky. Growing up on that, on that beautiful place, though, it did not prepare me for being on my own. My mom had always said, when you turn 18, I'll break your plate, which meant she was kicking us out. And I believed that and thought I had no other choice. And, you know, so I, I thought, when I'm 18, I have, to, I have to leave. So I considered my options. I could get married 
Only I didn't have a boyfriend, so that wasn't going to work. Um, I could get a job, but I didn't have a car, and she was not taking us to our job, so that wasn't going to work. But I did have a book scholarship, a $50 book scholarship at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, so I just took that book scholarship, and my parents took me to the train, and away I went. And so when I... <coughs> um, arrived in Fairbanks. I was pretty clueless, but apparently I did, in spite of the fact of being so clueless, I did have, I was really ready to leave home, even though I was terrified. So, and so I'm gonna read you this prose poem that is kind of tongue in cheek, um, but you can see that I did a couple things that I wasn't supposed to, so maybe I was kind of getting ready to you know, take off, time to be on my own. Survival tactics. This was almost the worst year of my life. It was before man walked on the moon. We lived among wild trees. I needed deodorant, but was afraid to say so. This was before my parents mentioned body odor, menstruation, or sex. They were divorced. I was still dreaming of being popular. Watergate was years away. No mass transit buses or cars I could drive. No boyfriend. Not before my mom said, when you turn 18, I'll break your plate. She had already made a career of suffering. I wasn't planning on following in her footsteps. You've already guessed women's lib and birth control were, topics, were not topics in our house. No one was home except me, so I slipped out to the road, my babysitting money in my cut-off jeans pocket, stuck my thumb out, caught a ride on the back of a stranger's Harley, burned the inside of my knee on the muffler. It was a price I didn't mind paying. I was keeping an appointment with the rest of my life. So. I think that was a little prelude to being able to leave the homestead. As I said, when I arrived on campus, I was really, I was ill-prepared, I was clueless, I was shy, I was homesick, and I was terrified. That's a good way to start your college career, huh? Um, I also was facing a pretty steep learning curve because I owned only two pairs of pants, and I thought that an army surplus blanket I brought from home would be considered suitable for a bedspread. No, it was not. And furthermore, I'd never had a boyfriend, and I did not know how to make small talk, because outside of school, we rarely um, saw any other kids or interacted with, interacted with them. And I think I mentioned that I was shy. But it didn't take long. I, I loved the freedom to be on my own, to make my own decisions, and to think whatever I wanted to. But at Thanksgiving, I was still missing home. And so I caught a ride with a friend to Anchorage and went back to the homestead, where I was very surprised how insular and stifling it seemed to me after having been at, in college just for uh, a little while. But even, even so, I knew I had been fortunate to grow up in that beautiful place. And I knew I was rich because of my access to and love for the natural world. Writing the poems in this book has helped me to understand my parents and that they have had difficult upbring they had difficult upbringings and they also had struggles trying to prove up on the homestead, things you don't know when you're a kid. And of course, money was, all, was tight and a, and a source of quite a bit of angst. I remember hearing them having, you know, sort of quiet conversations about how they were gonna deal with things. Um, still, the process of accepting my parents, it took a while and I'm going to read some poems about my parents now, and you, I think you will see 
the transformation and healing that, that happened in these poems. I'm going to read three first about my father. And they were written at different times in the process of writing this, this book. And, and the first one is called The Button Box. And in this one, I'm struggling with my relationship to my dad. It's, it's, really, a, it's really kind of an angry poem, quietly angry, but it's, it is, because it felt to me he would never follow through on anything. In fact, when I grew up, I followed through on a few things he said he would do, because I was so annoyed about it. And one of them was to plant a, a hedge of, of tundra roses that I, I think you guys know what that it, those are. Those are yellow flowers that grow, shrubby flowers that grow in the woods around here. The button box. I slipped the cardboard box from the treadle sewing machine drawer. Snooping, they would call it. But without nearby relatives or family albums, there's no other entry into my parents' histories. So I lift the hinged lid of Grandpa's old cigar box. Letters, pictures, I imagine those, and jewels maybe. But it holds only buttons, buttons so vivid the colors separate me from this drab house between forest and road. Explosions of aquamarine, cinnamon, mulberry, cerulean, vermilion, plum. I scoop them up, pour them back and forth between my hands, listen as they murmur like water over rocks, gossip about the shirts they've opened and closed, my parents who wore them waltzing in moonlight so silver it made a sound, dad's many pledges. It was an easy vocabulary without hindrances, but a trick of moonlight. Unfinished insulation in the passageway, a plywood floor riddled with knot holes, the army surplus blankets on our beds, disappointments everywhere, even the yard, weeds and mud, disheveled coops built from exhausted pallets, his talk of how he'd bid on carpet for the living room at the next surplus sale how he'd plant a hedge of sink foil dug from the forest, as if they had carpet, or he dug up anything, as if there was any money, any will. He kept up his talk, his face earnest, his plans so convincing I hunted for hope in his words. I vowed never to live with anyone capable of so much distortion again, or in a place with so many unkept promises that I tried to keep when I grew up, even though they were not my promises, not my bright, unfinished things. So from that poem, then, the next poem is, is uh, my, my father has now died, and, and I'm reflecting on all the things I never had a chance to talk to him about. It was easy not to have a chance to talk to my father about things, because when I'd go down to see him, I would, ha I would decide I, I was going to have a conversation with him. And I would get down there. I, I was going to talk to him. And I'd get about three words out, and he would start talking, and he'd never stop. So I was never able to, to have a relationship with him. So it took a while for me to make my peace. But this is uh, a poem where you can see there's a transition from me being angry with him to you know, it's a different space. It's called May at my father's burial. The coffin lowered now, covered over by earth. All the while the wind runs its cold, melancholy hands through my hair. We are out of time. 
no more chances he might speak to me from his heart. Grief and loss are cousins now, figures caught this day of sorrow, looking in the mirror at my blue reflection. I shiver and draw death's sad robe around my shoulders. I am not the first to wear it, but that's a lonely comfort. Then a flock of white homing pigeons released by friends circles the mourners. Their bright bodies wheel against the overcast sky, gaining altitude with each revolution. The thump and whirl of their wings like an ancient drum until at last they climb the sky, casting off for home. And then, then this is the last poem I want to read you about my dad. And I think this is a love poem to him. It's called My Father Hilling Potatoes. I loved my father that day, watching him hill potatoes with the red tractor. His brown khaki cap tilted to shade his eyes. If I told him I would give something up, no longer kept invisible by the grace of silence. I chose to stay in the willow's shadows as he drove up and down the rows of plants, their open blossoms spilling white across the field. Now, my mom, she grew up in Soldovia. She had a tough childhood, too. She had a father who, according to my uncle, um, my uncle said that, that their father beat them every day with a hose, for no reason, apparently, but he did. And when, when my husband and I visited Soldovia years later, and we, and we asked around town to see if anyone knew the family, and the two people we met who knew the family, this is what they both said. They were not in the same place. They saw, told us this, totally separate. They said, he was a mean man. That was what they said about my mom's dad. So, you know, people have tough lives and, it's, and you know, you can start to feel some empathy when you, when you know those things. So, um, of course, when I began writing this book, like I said, I wasn't necessarily feeling particular empathy for You know how you are when you leave home sometimes. You just, you think I'm out of there, you know, and I didn't have the greatest, um, I didn't have, I didn't, wouldn't say I didn't have the greatest relationship with my parents, but I didn't, we never had time to talk about anything. And they were, and my mom in particular was pretty, um, she was pretty uh, locked up, I guess I would say. She had, had, didn't have much of an, a very good upbringing. So anyway, but she tried pretty hard. And in this poem, she's teaching me uh, to make cupcakes. And that should be fun, right? So here we go. Baking lessons. My mother loads the wood stove, lights the fire, shows me how to sift flour, cream, margarine, and sugar how to crack eggs, keep shells out of the batter. The room is crowded with her corrections and her leftover wishes, heaps of words yesterday and before. Well, that's not a very empathetic poem at all. Um, in this next one, you, you can see that I, I'm beginning to understand my mother a little bit. She had, my mother had a brother who she helped raise, um, and he was about 13 years younger than she was, and they really adored each other, and he was quite the character. He had a motorcycle. So in this, in this um, poem, 
which is called Today is All They Have, he comes to visit. And she, my mother is smiling and so I, and happy, and I see her in a different way. But unfortunately, this happiness is not going to last because of another tragedy. But um, I did still see my mother, uh, you know, in a way that I, I didn't know her. Today is all they have. When my um uncle drives up on his new motorcycle, we run outside and gawk. While he grins and revs the engine, rides the concrete walkway around the house. He muscles that machine through the tight turns, then stops in front, kickstand down, sun collects in the folds of his leather jacket, his black hair combed back in waves like Fabian. He pulls a nickel from behind my brother's ear and steals my nose. We wonder what mom will say about these shenanigans, but she is smiling. They laugh together, the silhouette their arms take as they talk, the easy movements. She doesn't know that today is all they have, the yard steeped in light. He was five when their mother was sent to an asylum as the ship left the dock they, kept, they held their arms tight against their sides, keeping embraces they couldn't give. On the nearby pilings, cormorants waited their black feathers like cloaks, their shapes lit by morning's haze, silent, looking out for fish. Years later, in the local newspaper, she reads that pieces of his fishing boat washed up on that same beach, his body worn out by water, never found. In her dreams, he's a gray gull, feathers flattened by wind, the curve of its wing like an arch they could walk through to safety. So um, after my mom died, then my brother and sister and I gathered to scatter her ashes. And the homestead had been sold by this time. My parents divorced, and um, my father was dead. And so we, we gathered together uh, to figure out where we should spread the ashes. and. We got a little creative scattering some on my father's grave where he was buried next to his second wife. And we also tried to figure out where the homestead driveway would be. There were condos there now. And we just walked up there in broad daylight and scattered a few ashes there. And so that... Um, so this is a poem about that. It's called To Dust. I tuck the cardboard box in the trunk of my car. Inside, not the gray sand of Seldovia's beach or the fallen stars of dreams, but her seared bones crumbled to ash. Driving alone to the place we both loved, I recite the litany of her life, how empty it was. How empty she let it be. The pavement is hard like the sadness that hollowed her. When she was alive, I brought her red cranberries she made into sauce, bouquets of wildflowers, intoxicating as her liquor. Even now, above our ruined place, the Chugach peaks shrouded by clouds, the trees cloaked in green froth like it always was in spring. I look forward, I look to toward my sister and brother, glad they have come. We make baskets of our hands, take the ashes, these fragments, all that is left, throw them on dad's grave and in the street covering our driveway, 
on the clump of trees that grew near the homestead garage, into the yards of strangers who live here now, but do not come out of their duplexes. Our skin is like the bark of the missing trees. <clears throat> So our parents, I said our parents had been divorced, and this was when I was about 14. And my, after my father died, our stepmother sold the homestead, and it was now worth a considerable amount of money. Um, she, she had a new will written in which she wrote the three of us kids of the, my parents' union out of the will. And this was against my father's wishes. He... Um, she had never lived on the homestead or had any part in his development. And my father had told us that it was his wish that the homestead would be left to us kids. But, you know, you don't get to, there's nothing you can do about that when that happens. Some things like that happen. He apparently did not set up the trust correctly. So suddenly we were disinherited. So, um, <clears throat> I was pretty angry, I have to say, and I thought it was un the injustice was pretty unbelievable, and I tried to talk to her about it, but she was not enter entertaining any conversation. She had actually left her the inheritance to some relatives she had in, um, that lived outside that um, had never lived in Alaska. So I was pretty angry, and I spent, I spent some time screaming at the universe when no one was home. And, and then I wrote a poem about it, which was a terrible poem. And then I left that alone for a while. And then finally I wrote this poem, which I think is a better poem. It's called On Being Disinherited. Raised on solitude, everything I knew learned on our homestead, picking blueberries from scattered bushes, their citrus and sweet juice spreading on my tongue. By the creek, kneeling to catch tadpoles carried home in jam jars. At the moose swamp's edge where dad perched in a tree, not in the Baptist pew, he and his new wife favored after the divorce, where he was saved in case there's a heaven. Back from college, his talking interrupting my story of black scoters migrating along the Bering Sea coast, the shrill whistling of their wings, their calls, a hoarse craw. How they blanketed the sky like a resurrection, a different resurrection than his. That afternoon in our kitchen, when dad said he left the homestead to us kids, sun came through the blinds, broke apart, shredded, into ribbons. His confident voice, his words so sure I wanted to believe him. But my stepmother changed the will after he died, knowing the dead would never know she wiped out our names. I discovered how easy it is to become irrelevant, how quickly I bruise. By then, I'd forgotten how to pray so I sat by the river, let go of pretending to love her, watched lost trees slide through the water and dark branches of spruce bend from their trunks to the forest floor, all the light sucked out of them. The, the biggest challenge I, I encountered when I was writing this book, as if those weren't big enough, right, <laughs> was how to deal with um, the sexual abuse that occurred in my family. I wasn't aware of it un until I was in my 30s. Um, because everything was kept hushed up. And since I was not abused myself, I had no idea it had happened. Or if I did, I had, I had buried it. And when, when a family member told me uh, years later, after I left home, I was shocked. I was devastated. 
and I felt sad and I felt like I had been betrayed. So, and that lasted for a while. It lasted, um, I don't know if I had written anything yet in this book because I, I think I was in my 30s then. So, but I, it was, it was, it was pretty devastating because I thought my childhood was idyllic and that seemed wrong. Um, so I s tried to make my peace with having escaped the abuse too, which of course, another thing that happens. Um, I didn't know what to do with the knowledge, with the fact that it had been hidden and, not, and unacknowledged and unpunished. And it seemed to me that the, the beauty of the homestead was tarnished. And I had always thought that there were beautiful mountains there, you know, the Chugach Peaks. And I, I had always considered those peaks to be guardians, kind of guardians for us kids, you know. I thought they were beautiful. I thought they watched over me. And of course, now I felt like they had betrayed me and they looked like saw blades um, after that. So it was, um, it was not until uh, a few years ago, actually, after I finished this book that, uh, in fact, recently we were, in, we were in Anchorage and I looked at those mountains and I thought, those are the most beautiful mountains. I, I remember their, them from home. So, um, you know, I, I think that, that memoir heals you. I really do. I think the writing of these poems um, had that effect. Um, but when I was trying to figure out what to do about this, I, I, I thought, well, maybe I can just pretend it never happened. No one knows about it. Um, I, did I really want to tackle the shame and the secrecy and the privacy issues? That would, that would ensue if I decided to reveal this, even in poetry. Luckily, I had a, a long time writing group that um, knew a little bit about this, because I, I had mentioned it, and they urged me not to bury the sexual abuse. They said it was important to bear witness. So ultimately, I did write about it, and sometimes I, I did by asking permission of the person who I knew it was abused, and other times I decided I could write about it and keep the silence for people that did not want to speak if I wrote in first person. Because then people would assume that I had been abused because the speaker of the poem is first person. And I, by that time I was okay with that because I, I thought that I just wanted to bear witness to this. So. Um, and, and it's, you know, you, when you suffer this kind of trauma, you don't know what's going to happen. But um, there's actually a quote from Joseph, Joseph Campbell that says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasures you seek. And I would say that that um, quote applies to examining and writing about difficult events and that they can heal you. So I, I have a, a few poems, just a few more poems. Um, I have, th this is a, an example of a poem I wrote in first person, um, so bearing witness to the, the trauma that had occurred. It's called I watched the hired men pick potatoes. And in, in this poem, there, my, we did grow potatoes on our homestead. So, and we did hire people that, to help pick. So that part is true, but there's nothing much else true about it. I watched the hired men pick potatoes. In the blanched light of morning, birch trees play their yellow cards, poking the sky with empty branches. The hired men drag burlap sacks over the dug-up field, gathering the round tubers. Bulging sacks are piled high on the truck's flatbed as it rattles by. I keep to myself until lunchtime when the pickers come to our table, peacock-friendly, brandishing their black pails. I wither against the wall, listening, keeping back from their maleness. The hour blooms with their talk. 
Later, one takes me on fossil hunting trips, flashing his schizophrenic smile before he undresses me. His love is a knife he cuts me with. I make myself empty until amnesia floats over the day. I remember only the bear berries, serrated red leaves, how they scorch and flare. Around our empty field, the nude trees turn to ice. And the, the next poem is the, the, the final poem I'm going to read. It, it was one of the last poems I wrote for the book, and it, it calls out my parents for enabling the abuse that occurred and for allowing them to live on our property. And of course, of course, um, my parents were already dead when I wrote this poem. That's how long it took me to heal. But I, I like this poem. I feel like it, it's brave and um, it feels beautiful to me because when I wrote it, I felt like I had mended. Someone should have kicked the pedophiles off our place. I remember how we unraveled after the men parked trailers in our clearing. What did we own to understand their eyes, the unstalled weather of their longing? The body does not choose frost or ice for its doors. It wants to slide out windows, believe that stars are wayposts spilling light. Night is a shingled roof above the path, pebbled with footprints, which leads to him waiting. Who is to tell her what she will find, that her parents will not mend her? So in conclusion, I want to say that um, I, uh, that somehow, like I said, I, that poem made me feel like I was mended, too. And how else could you heal if you don't face what's happened to you that is hard? How can you become whole if you don't face that? Because as things can be mended, so can people be mended. There's a, there's a Japanese art called kintsugi, which speaks to this for me. Kintsugi is two words, kint, which means gold, and sugi, which means repair or joinery. In the art of kintsugi, broken pottery is fixed by filling in the cracks or the broken areas with a lacquer that's mixed with gold or with powdered gold, silver, or platinum. So the broken spaces are mended with gold. Kintsugi treats breakage and repair as a part of the history of, of an object rather than something to disguise. And as I wrote these poems and coming out of nowhere, I wanted to reflect on the memories of the homestead and my childhood there. I didn't know that with that examination, the power the traumatic mem memories had over me would vanish but I'm glad they did. Nor did I know the cracks in my psyche would be repaired with the gold of poetry, beautiful evidence of how I became strong and resilient. Thank you so much. And I don't, I don't know if people have questions, but I think we have some, a little bit of time if people want to ask them. Thanks, Linda. What's on the homestead today? Condos. <laughs> if you go down the old Seward, High Seward Highway and um, around, around um, 100th Street, there's a, a Spenard Builders, I think is what's there. And across from that is where the homestead was. But there's nothing you could recognize. It's all condominiums and, and uh, houses. So that's what happened. That it got that you know it got sold. Close to Anchorage. 
Oh, I, I, I was thinking, but I didn't um, voice it. And I was thinking this, this has been very therapeutic, I would think. And I think you mentioned that. And uh, um, I would think that it would be very helpful for uh, uh, young people at, uh, I was once on a board that we uh, were at API and also at the uh, the state, um, I don't know, juvenile jail that was next door to it down in Anchorage. And a lot of kids would really benefit from reading those poems, I think. Well, well thank you for that. That I mean, it, it, it definitely, I mean, it, it worked as magic on me, I'll tell you, writing about this. I mean, it, it, it um, takes away the power that these memories have over you when you write about them and explore them and see how you feel about it. And I mean, I feel like I'm a whole person. I, I have those cracks, right? But I hope they're filled with gold or something like that. But if, if you knew me, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, you would have found me much shyer and much less confident and you know, so it, it's a wonderful tool, for sure. I wonder, Linda, I, I, I feel like the, um, well, from my perspective as somebody who's um, pretty familiar with it at this point, I, I, I think um, it, it, there's some sleight of hand, I think, that happens. I, I think that um, the poems, I think, upon first glance, come across kind of as, as kind of play-space poems. I mean, it's, it's very clear that you're blending your identity with the identity of the place, but um, I think it's rare, actually, to encounter um, place but that poems in that kind of subgenre is so kind of raw and personal and, 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 and open. So I wonder if you mentioned something before about the, about the mountains and, and the way that you view the place and how that has changed over time. It's, I wonder if you could say some more about um, your thoughts and your feelings about uh, the, the place and your identification with it and, and how that's kind of morphed and, and developed over this span of your life. I mean, I had to make my peace with it, right? What am I going to do? I, the, it's gone. and. It's not what I wish would have happened. I wish that, well, you know, I think the three of us kids, what we were hoping to do if my father had actually put the homestead in the trust, which is what he said he wanted to do. So that he said he wanted to leave uh, something to us kids. He said that on his deathbed. And he had a trust set up, and but it, you have to do things, you have to populate the trust, you have to do things, and he, he, he didn't do that. Um, so then, um, what we were going to do is we were going to, my, my mother was always, she was pretty um, poor, and so uh, what we were planning to do was if the money had been left to us, uh, we, would have, we wanted to build her a house, is what we wanted to do. So. Um, that never that never happened, but she ended up find, having a place to live. Um, so, but but the I mean I really I had to make my peace with all of it because otherwise I could never go to Anchorage again, you know. It, and for a while it was hard. I think reading this writing this book, um, and we were just down in Anchorage about uh, a few weeks ago and. We were visiting a friend who had a condo that looked over the mountains. And I looked at those mountains, and they were so beautiful. And I, I just kind of nudged John and said, those are the mountains I could see out the window when I did the dishes every day. And, and I realized it didn't hurt. you know. And for, I'd go down there, I'd look at those mountains, and it was like I couldn't look. It was like they were cutting me. I think there's a poem in here about that. So I, you know, I just, writing this book, I, I made my peace with it. You thank goodness, right? But what else, there's the, the alternative is not a good one. So, you know, so now it's just Anchorage grows and it's it's huge <laughs> and it doesn't look anything like it did when the when the 
hospital I was born in. It was down on the Park Strip, and the, uh, my dad used to get a moose every year right out our back door, which is now on the other side of the, uh, the Seward Highway, you know. <laughs> Uh, so it's all different, and you just have to, that's just the way it is, you know. I feel blessed. I have a, a, a wonderful life here, so. so. Um, I, do have one, I do have one last question. Okay. I, I, think, um, I, I think what you and Don are saying both about, um, about memoir and about personal writing and about confronting, I think, um, challenging, Elements of you know your your past. I, I I guess I agree that 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 does sound like it has like great potential. I wonder for for those of us who are not um, award winning poets, uh, <laughs> do, do you have advice or do you have tips for how to engage um, in that way and, and sort of to explore some of those things? For yeah, so? How to explore memoir, for example. Yeah. Um, well, you don't. I think you can. First, you can consider that you don't have to show it to anyone, right? You can, you can just start writing something for yourself, and you can take little steps um, and write something. I mean, I, I think I, I tried to illustrate by those family poems with, about my parents that, you know, I, I would write something. If, I, if you're angry, which you probably would be if you, if you had circumstances like, like these and worse that many people do, um, you could, should be angry and write it down. And then the, I think the more you, the, my experience is the more you write, the more you heal. Because you, you, it allows you to look at um, these events in a different way because they're outside of you. When they're on the paper, they're somewhere else. And in my case, particularly, I was writing poetry, so I was trying to make a good poem, too. And you don't actually have to be truthful if you're writing a poem, either. So you can do what you want. And, and you know, I looked, I looked up this topic of memoir um, a few years ago, maybe three, two or three years ago, and there wasn't much on, that I could find online, but now there's a lot. There's, um, you know, there, there are people writing about how memoir, um, writing memoir heals, heals you. There's, there's, and, and there's, there's actually a, there's a, what do they call it? I, I was going to mention it. I, I think I forgot to mention it. Uh, there's a, um, there's a word for, um, if you, for a kind of trauma, if you let's say you go to a counselor and you and you talk to them about your, about what's bothering you, and then the counselor actually takes on uh, some of the trauma because they have to listen. They listen to all this stuff. So um, what do they call it? It's, I can't remember what it's called. Um, Vicarious trauma is what they call it. If you if you are um, telling someone about your trauma, I, I don't know if that's. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if you're writing about trauma, somehow you release it, but you're. I don't know who you're giving it to. The pa the poem maybe, you know, <laughs> or the what you're writing. So, I, I, you know, it's just. It, I I guess I would urge people if they have something they want to work out, you don't have to show it to anyone if you're being, feeling, feeling shy. You can just write it. It does help. It takes a while, though. In my case, it took a number of years for it to happen. So, Anyway, if there's no other questions, I'll...